Today's webinar will cover a premium tax credit reconciliation. Today's presenter here at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities is Tara Straw, Senior Policy Analyst. I'll turn it over to Tara. Thank you so much, Ina. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, this is our, I think it's our sixth year doing this series, which is pretty amazing um, since the we first started reconciling the premium tax credit. This used to be a two or three part series um, because we had all of those uh, complications due to the health insurance mandate, which has been zeroed out and so doesn't factor into the tax returns the same way it has in the past. And so we're narrowing this down to one topic, the premium tax credits. But I'm sure you'll see by the end of this that that is plenty to cover and that an hour is just barely enough time to do it. Um, for those who don't know me, um, my name is uh, Tara Straw and I work at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities doing, doing healthcare, but also with a strong interest in things that intersect with the tax program. So I've been a VITA trainer and volunteer for mm, probably about 15, gosh, maybe 20 years. Um, and so I know that world pretty well uh, um, as well. And um, I'm excited to talk to all of you as I am every year about your important work as volunteers and how we can help people um, who have uh, also needed healthcare help this year. So let's start with the very basic eligibility criteria for the premium tax credit. To receive a premium tax credit, and I'm going to call this and have this in the presentation as PTC in a lot of places, a person has to enroll in a marketplace plan, so not just any plan, but a plan that's available in the health insurance marketplace, uh, which is healthcare.gov in most states. They have to have income between 100 and 400 percent of the federal poverty line. I'll refer to this as FPL. Um, and you can see those numbers here um, for an individual that's just under, um, under $50,000 a year and for a family of four that's just around $100,000 a year. But there are some exceptions where people with income below 100% of the poverty line can claim the premium tax credit um, if they uh, believed at the time they enrolled that they would be income eligible for the credit or if they're lawfully present immigrants who are ineligible for Medicaid. And we'll talk about those two exceptions in a little more detail um, in a few minutes. People also have to have an eligible filing status. Um, the PTC can't be claimed by a person who is married filing separately, and it can't be claimed by a dependent. And a person can't be eligible for or enrolled in other minimum essential coverage. So that includes Medicare, Medicaid, and employer-sponsored coverage. But there are, there are exceptions to all of those, and so we'll talk more about those. So uh, who must file a Form 8962? If a person received any advance payments of the PTC, they must file a tax return. Um, and I'm going to, we'll refer to the advance payments as APTC. Um, that's distinguished from PTC. So APTC is like the estimated version, um, the estimated amount that people get throughout the year um, sent directly to their health insurers and PTC is the final amount that is um, calculated on the tax return. A person has to file Form 8962 if any member of the tax family received APTC, or if a member of the tax family purchased health insurance in the marketplace and they didn't receive um, APTC, but they're eligible to claim it now, so they took the option to not receive it in advance, but to claim it on the tax return. Um, or, and this is complicated, if a taxpayer received APTC for someone they thought would be claimed as a dependent, but is not claimed and is, and is on no one else's tax return. So just to um, put this in perspective, here's an example. Diane enrolls her 19-year-old son, Danny, in, a market, in marketplace coverage, assuming she'll claim him as a dependent. But at the end of the year, Danny can't be claimed as a dependent. He could file his own taxes, including Form 8962, but if he doesn't file, Diane has to reconcile the PTC. That's because Diane signed him up, and so Diane ultimately is gonna be the one who's responsible for making sure that that credit is reconciled. Um, and this is, I know that this is, um, this is a bone of contention in some programs. I get a lot of, I get a lot of flack about this one, but this is, um, this rule is directly out of the, out of the instructions and out of the regulations. Um, so I don't think we have a ton of flexibility uh, in, in how we apply this. 
So there are a couple of possible outcomes at reconciliation. One is that someone could get more. So if no PTC is taken in advance, or if only a portion of the um, uh, PTC is claimed in advance, the remainder is refundable and can be claimed on the tax return. But then other taxpayers will need to pay back. So if the taxpayer receives excess advance payments of the, of the PTC, some or all of it must be paid back. And you can see the chart here on repayment limits. We'll refer to this um, in several places as, as the caps, repayment caps. Um, but you can see that for people who have income less than 200% of the poverty line, a single taxpayer will pay back no more than $300 other taxpayers will pay back no more than $600. And that goes up until um, people at 400% and above who have no repayment cap and have to fully repay any credit they receive through the year if their income uh, trips over that wire. So here is the form um, 1095A. Um, people will get this if they enrolled in in any, uh, in any marketplace coverage, whether or not they got a premium tax credit in, in, in advance. Um, just walking through some of the information, this hasn't changed from previous years, they haven't changed the form. But in column A, you've got the monthly enrollment premium. Um, this is the entire plan premium. Now there might be some exceptions. Um, there um, could, are sometimes certain extra benefits that don't count um, into the the enrollment premium that goes on to the 1095A. But in general, this is basically the full premium um, that someone of the plan that someone has signed up for. Then we've got the second lowest cost silver plan. Um, this is, I know it's very jargony. Um, even for health people, it's very jargony. Um, but this is the benchmark plan that helps establish the PTC amount. So all of the magic and the math on how we calculate a premium tax credit, it all is based on, okay, what's the cost of this decent plan? We're calling a decent plan the second lowest cost silver plan. Um, and uh, so that is going to be necessary for, to know for each individual who is, who is um, eligible for a premium tax credit. That's how we're basing their credit on. But the amount on the 1095A might be incorrect in this column. If there was no APTC paid, um, or if there was some unreported change in circumstance, like maybe um, a person was, uh, maybe a child was born into the family during the year, or, or maybe uh, someone who was a dependent in the household is no longer a dependent. So if there were changes in circumstances, that, plant, that um, number in column B might not be accurate. If this is blank, uh, note that the, the month's PTC won't calculate. And this is going to be important later, we'll see in some examples, because um, you, know, you don't want to shortchange someone uh, just because the number here was blank. What we're going to talk about in a, in a couple different places is that you have some flexibility in column B. If you think column B is wrong or if something in column B is missing, you are deputized to go out and fix it. Um, you don't need to get a corrected form. Um, you are just able to go in and fix it. So you can get the correct uh, figure at healthcare.gov slash tax dash tool or from your state-based marketplace if you're in a state that has its own marketplace. And third, um, in column C, we've got the monthly um, advance payment of the premium tax credit. This is the amount that has already been sent month by month to directly to the health insurer. So what if the AP or what if the uh, 1095A is wrong? So as I just said, if this if the second lowest cost silver plan, and sometimes I call this the slick sip, um, if the slick sip is wrong or missing, then use the lookup tool to find the correct one um, to put on uh, form 8962 or to enter in, into tax layer. Uh, the marketplace is not going to send you a corrected 1095A just to correct a slick sip. So you know, it's not a form that you need to have a taxpayer wait to receive because it's not common, first of all. Um, but also, you know, you can get this information yourself and the IRS specifically says in the instructions that you can just fix it without getting a corrected form. Um, but if there's anything else wrong, the taxpayer should call the marketplace to get an amended form. 
Requests for amended forms, though, remember, don't always require filing delays because, you know, I know how important it is to not, you know, have people in for an appointment, then send them away, and then try to get them to come back and then complete their return then. So if an error doesn't affect the PTC calculation, uh, so if, if you have something like an incorrect address, if the social security number is wrong, the, the numbers on the birth date are flipped, you, can, you should definitely seek a correction to make sure the IRS gets the right thing but the consumer can go ahead and file anyway. Don't, you don't need to wait. If an error does affect the PTC calculation, like the consumer um, swears that they were getting a PTC, but the form says they weren't or, or something like that, then definitely get corrected information before filing. Uh, and sometimes the consumer can get that information over the phone. So let's walk through the tax layer screens. They're actually very streamlined, which is great, um, except you know, then we're gonna talk about all the special rules that don't quite get captured on the, on the screens. Um, and if you have any comments about the functionality of TaxSlayer or any um, questions as we go through, definitely feel free to type them into the chat. And then we'll, um, at the end, we'll take lots of questions and you can definitely play, um, play Stump the Professor with us. Um, so the health insurance questionnaire is only a couple of questions this year. At first, did you purchase health insurance in healthcare.gov or state marketplace? If someone did not purchase um, insurance in healthcare.gov or state marketplace, then that's the end of your healthcare questions for today. But if they did, then you're, you'll go on and, and be asked to enter in your household members to verify your household members that you've entered on the return. Um, there is an option at the top of this next box to add a new household member. Now I will say in general, that's a bad idea. Um, but there's one time when it might make sense. Um, you might do that if there is a non-filing, non-dependent whose credit the taxpayer must reconcile. So yes. So remember that example that we had with Danny, who was the 19 year old and his mom signed him up for insurance, but then he couldn't be a dependent. Um, and then he didn't bother filing his taxes. And so mom was kind of stuck taking his, um, having to reconcile his, um, his APTC. Well, basically this is the Danny, um, the Danny option is adding a new household member. So if you're doing mom's return, you would have to, this is where you would have to add Danny. And if you added him here, he would not be added as a dependent. So it wouldn't affect your, um, your household size or dependents or any of that. Um, he, he would just be added for the purpose of the ACA. So I think that that's really the only very isolated case you would use um, that option in. But you know, the, there's probably maybe one of you on the phone that will see that one time. So, I, so don't get worried about it, but in general, I think you're more likely to see something uh, where you are tempted to use it, but shouldn't use it. So be careful, because if you have a non-dependent who is um, on the Form 1095A, but is going to be on another tax return, that's something else called a shared policy allocation. And you don't wanna just start adding household members um, in that case. Um, a shared policy allocation, we'll talk more about later, but it's essentially um, when you've got one 1095A, that needs to cover a couple of families. And how do you divide up the numbers on that 1095A to put on a couple of different tax returns? Um, so that's a case where you might see extra people on the 1095A, but you don't wanna add them to this return because then you know, you're, you're ignoring the shared policy allocation and you don't wanna do that. And then you're asked a question, did you receive a 1095A? Um, and as we said before, this is what a 1095A looks like. Um, the marketplace has been pretty good about getting them out on time. Yay. Then we get into some trickier questions. The next question asks, are you required to repay all of the APTC received? And then it gives you some help text, which is really helpful. In most cases, the answer is no. Only answer yes if you are not considered lawfully present in the US or you meet the health coverage tax credit criteria. Um, and then note will automatically calculate a full repayment of APTC when MAGI, which is household income, is greater than 400% of the federal poverty line. So as the health text says, almost everyone should answer no here. You should answer no about being required to repay all of the APTC 
if you're eligible to claim the PTC, but even if you're not eligible to claim it, like for instance, if, if someone is married filing separately and you know, based on, based on what you know about the credit, that someone can't claim the credit if they're married filing separately, um, you still should answer no on this because even though they don't meet one of the rules to get the credit, that doesn't mean they need to repay the entire credit because they're subject to a repayment cap. So if you answer yes here, you're going to take away the repayment cap. And the only times we take away the repayment cap from people are for people who are not lawfully present um, and for people, as it says above, who have um, received both APTC and the health coverage tax credit. The health coverage tax credit is a, is a very rare separate, um, separate credit for people who um, qualified under this under an old law called the, I think, Trade Adjustment Assistance Act or something. Um, and if you have someone who has income above the um, above 400% of poverty, then tax is automatically going to trigger repayment regardless of, regardless of your answer here. So just keep this in mind because you don't want to accidentally, um, to, to accidentally take away someone's repayment cap because that can result in significantly higher repayment. Um, and so you can, you can take a look, um, this just shows you what it looks like on 8962, uh, which is the form that, um, where the reconciliation happens. So you can see at line 28, um, there should be a repayment cap in there. Whether or not the repayment cap is breached, there should be a repayment cap in there. And so if it doesn't show a repayment cap, you should go back to check your answer for the, on this question because you might have answered it incorrectly. The next question is really quite tricky, and this is this is one of my one of my biggest bugaboos with tax layer generally. Um, is your household income below 100% of the federal poverty line, and do you meet all the requirements under either estimated household income at least 100% of the federal poverty line, or alien lawfully present in the United States? That is a humdinger of a question. Um, unfortunately, for some people, this default is no. Um, which is a really, really bad thing. Um, if you say no, it triggers repayment for people who really in 99.9% you know, .9 of cases should be eligible. So yes is going to apply to most people, but tax layer likes to default here to no. So in order to figure this out, you need to, you need to read the question very slowly. Um, and you need to know the general rule. The general rule is that a person with income under the poverty line can claim the premium tax credit if they were enrolled in marketplace coverage and received APTC. So what happens on the front end of marketplace enrollment is that someone goes through an application, they're asked all of these questions about their income, and all of this information is verified against prior tax returns or against other government sources. So people aren't just, you know, just throwing down an income and hoping, you know, and just, um, we're not just relying only on the word of the taxpayer. There's also a lot of verification that happens. And so it's possible though, that someone has a, a number, an income amount that's verified, that's above the poverty line, they look eligible, the marketplace says they're eligible for premium tax credits, but then at the end of the year, they didn't quite meet that income. You know, maybe they lost their job, maybe they had two part-time jobs and lost one of them. And so they end up under the poverty line. But the, but the, um, the IRS is not going to just take the whole credit away just because they've fallen under the poverty line because the marketplace made that eligibility determination. So, um, so keep this in mind, most people are going to um, fall into this um, exception for having projected income above 100% of the poverty line and receiving APTC on, on that basis. There's the second exception for a person who is lawfully present, um, uh, a lawfully present immigrant who is ineligible for Medicaid due to immigration status. Again, that gets buried in the weeds on healthcare, but there are some people who are, um, who are lawfully present, but they're not eligible for Medicaid because they haven't been in the, in the country for a certain number of years. And that's, those rules are set by their state. Um, but they're still eligible for a premium tax credit. And so um, they would also be covered under this, under this big, beautiful question. So make sure that you're not just letting this default. The default to this is going to be wrong for a lot of people. 
Um, and instead, the answer for the vast majority of people is going to be yes. Now, if you have any questions on the lawfully present immigrant piece of it, because I know people do, um, immigration status is not something that we ask questions about on, uh, about, uh, on tax returns. But think of it this way. People have already gone through verification of their identity, of their citizenship, of their immigration status in order to get into the, in, in order to get into, um, you know, enrollment in the marketplace and then uh, premium tax credits. So the marketplace has already done that vetting for you. You're not, you're, you're not being asked to determine whether someone is, lawf is a lawfully present immigrant. Um, and, and actually, if you, if you go through scenarios, you'll find that the second situation with the lawfully present immigrant is really wholly wrapped up in the first one, almost, because these are generally people who have gone through, um, who, were, who projected having income above 100%, or they didn't have income above 100%, and they received APTC anyway. So those groups are actually, can actually be um, set up in the same rules. So the, the bottom line here, though, is to not just allow the default to, to occur because you may find that you um, are, are taking away credit from some people. And this is just an, uh, a look at the full 8962 so you can see what this looks like. So at the top, you have a, um, a percentage of income that's under 100%. And then you can see that all of the beautiful information you put in on line 11 about the, um, uh, the information from the 1095A has all been deleted and it's gone and you only have the, um, the APTC amount left. And then at the bottom of the page, you can see that the repayment cap is being applied and that they're being asked to repay $300. Now, if this is a person with income below the poverty line, they shouldn't, they, they, in, in the vast, vast majority of cases, shouldn't have any repayment. So even that $300 repayment is too much repayment. Okay, continuing on, you're asked just a couple more questions. First, whether all forms 1095A include coverage for January through December. Um, so are you entering annual amounts or are you entering monthly amounts? And then the only other screen you get is asking about dependents modified AGI. You're only going to enter information in here if the dependent has a filing requirement. And note that with the, under the uh, TCG, uh, uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act um, of 2017, there are very few dependents, at least very few that I've seen, who do have tax filing requirements. The higher dependent uh, filing threshold means very few dependents have a tax filing requirement. So this screen should almost always be blank. So that means if, if a dependent um, had, had, let's say, $5,000 in earned income, um, you, would, you would not enter that amount here. Why? Because they don't have a filing requirement. We've got the um, tax-dependent filing requirement there as a, as, a help, as a reminder, but it's also in the um, publication 4012. So you would not add in the dependent's income. If you do add in dependent's income, even if they don't have a filing requirement, it's going to calculate on the 8962. It's not going to siphon that out for you. So you need to apply the rules. It's um, the tax layer isn't going to do it in the back end for you. Okay, so let's look at some of the more um, some of the issues that uh, that come into those questions that you just answered before, um, but that aren't really explicit in the, in the software. So these are some common issues that we've seen over the years, and you can uh, write in and tell us if, if you've seen other common issues that you want us to address. So one issue is someone who says, I thought I would file jointly, but I'm really married filing separately. So in general, as we said before, the rule is that a taxpayer can't claim PTC, PTC if they're married filing separately. Just like with the earned income credit, just like with some other credits, you, you just are not eligible for them if you're married filing separately. But there are exceptions here that, that, that don't apply in other places in the tax code. Um, these two exceptions can only be used for a maximum of three years though. So some people may have used, sort of used up their exceptions, but here they are. It's domestic abuse. The taxpayer lives apart from their spouse and is unable to file a joint return because of domestic abuse. 
um, and abandon spouses. So the taxpayer lives apart from the spouse and is unable to locate the spouse with reasonable diligence. Um, now somewhere on this form, um, somewhere in the questions, you're gonna get that little box that says check here if you are filing a separate return only because you're a victim of domestic abuse or spousal abandonment. Um, that, that little box will trigger if you, if you are married filing separately. If you're not married filing separately, you don't see the box. But if you have that status, then the box is going to appear and you can check it or not check it depending on whether the, one of the exceptions applies. Um, even if one of the exceptions does not apply and the person is married filing separately and will need to repay the credit, um, remember there is still the safety valve of eligibility for the repayment cap. So as long as their income is below 400% of the poverty line, they'll, they'll, they'll still be subject to the pay, repayment cap, even if um, they are um, ineligible for the credit because they're married filing separately. And here's an example. Um, Alma hadn't seen her husband in over a year. She applied for health coverage um, and she said she was single. She was awarded APTC. Well, a tax filing, you go through all the rules and you inform Alma that her filing status is actually married filing separately. She can't claim to be single. Um, and you explain that a person cannot claim PTC if they're married filing separately. Uh, to avoid repayment, you can ask her about her eligibility for the, one of these exceptions. And here, based on her facts, abandonment might apply. Um, but has she used due diligence to locate the spouse? And she says yes, <laughs> or, or, or no, actually. He, he lives with his new girlfriend at Arlington. I could call him. I know where he is, but I don't have any interest in filing taxes with him or in talking to him. Well, in this case, you know, if those are your facts, the exception doesn't apply. And Alma is going to have to repay her, um, her APTC up to the repayment cap. Um, in, in that case, you would enter the 1095A as it appears, and tax layer is going to trigger payback of the APTC um, up to the repayment cap. So still enter what, what appears on the 1095A, and tax layer will take care of that in the back end. Um, another common issue is that sometimes people get multiple 1095As. Um, in the same family. Sometimes this is because there was an actual change in the plan selection. They started with plan A and then went to plan B and the premiums and everything changed. In other cases, um, other kinds of changes can trigger a new form. And so this is just a quick little um, guide on how to put these forms together. You can only enter in one 1095A in tax layer. You can't like go to a page two and enter in a second 1095A. You need to figure out how to make all of these numbers fit on, you know, on one 1095A. So if you have multiple forms, um, for column A, you're going to add the premiums together because the premium is assumed just to be for the people who are on the form. Um, so if you have, you know, two forms that both have coverage in January and February, then you would add those premiums together. Um, for the slick SIP, if they're in the same state, the slick SIP should be the same on both forms. So if it says 400 on, on form one and 400 on form two, then, on form two, then you would put um, 400 as the slick SIP. You wouldn't add them. You would only add them if they're in different states. The other um, thing you can do here if you're uncertain, and who wouldn't be uncertain in this circumstance, is that you can use the tool, the healthcare.gov slash tax um, dash tool. And for APTC, in general, you're going to add the APTC columns together. So if you have two forms that have January coverage, you'll add both APTC amounts together. And here's a quick example of that. Felicia and Murphy properly claim their 27-year-old daughter, Gwen, as a dependent. They enroll together as a household in the same plan, but they can't be on the same policy. And this is just because of insurers' rules about you know, who can be on a policy together. Um, this is a... a dependent but someone who's not a minor dependent so they can't be on the same policy together therefore they get separate forms um, on the 1095a so you can see form one has um, the totals for felicia and murphy and form two has the totals for gwen you would add the premium amounts um, on in column a you would use the common uh, slick SIP in column B, and you would add the amounts in column C to, um, to enter this information into TaxSlayer. 
And if you have any doubt about what's in column B and whether that's correct, you can always look it up at the, at the um, healthcare.gov tax tool. Another common issue is a failure to pay premiums. And so you will see the way you'll know that happened is if you see a blank box where it says monthly enrollment premiums. So if there's, no, if there's nothing entered there, that means the person did not pay their premium for that month. Or at least it means that the marketplace doesn't believe that they paid their premium for that month. If a taxpayer misses a premium, um, the, that, that box is going to be blank. If, but if there are multiple boxes um, where there are um, APTC, but there's no premium in column A, then this is likely an error. So you should call, you should call the marketplace. But if you see just one where the, the monthly enrollment premium is blank, but there's something in column C, then this might mean that they, um, they missed their premium and then they lost their coverage um, after a grace period. So there, but there are two options here. Now, if you just key what you see, if you enter this in exactly as, exactly as this is, it's going to trigger a repayment of the, of the premium tax credit. So a repayment of one month of, of, of payment, so $450 repayment. Um, but the second option is for the taxpayer to actually pay the premium for that month. So um, that would mean in this case, the enrollee share of the premium is about $95, might be a little more, a little less depending on the plan, but um, $95, uh, which is the full amount of premium minus the APTC. And so that's less expensive uh, than actually having to repay the APTC of $450. So keep in mind this, this kind of special rule. A lot of people don't know about it and don't apply it. Rather than having to pay back that month of APTC, which is probably more, um, then you, you can instead decide to pay your premium to the insurance company, as long as you do it prior to the tax deadline. Even though you've already lost your coverage, doesn't matter. If you, if you, if you can pay that premium by the tax deadline, then uh, you can claim the APTC for that month. So an example, Greg had an unexpected car repair in March, could not afford to make his April insurance premium. He made no other um, payments and his coverage was canceled retroactive to the end of April. So you can see what that looks like um, uh, based on the information from the 1095A. This is how it translates into the 8962. Taxlayer is going to trigger a repayment of about $980 in APTC um, received for April. But his alternative is to pay his May, is, oh, sorry, that should be April, to pay the, the portion of the April premium, $52, which is the monthly enrollment premium minus the monthly APTC, um, in order to claim APTC for that month. And then after he pays the premium, he should request a new 1095A from the marketplace, just so the IRS is on the same page. Okay, another common scenario with the 1095A is that column A is completed, but another column is blank. Um, so if, if a 1095A looks like this, um, and the taxpayer didn't receive APTC in the month, in the, month um, the, the middle column here, the slick SIP might be blank. And if the slick SIP is blank, the software isn't going to calculate PTC for those months, even if a taxpayer is eligible. So it's up to you to determine um, PTC eligibility based on the rules for any months that a premium was paid. So I can tell here that this taxpayer, they paid premiums January through May. Um, they received a premium tax credit in January, February, and March. They didn't receive one in April and May, but that doesn't mean they weren't eligible. And so what we're gonna do is, you know, if, if they, um, seem eligible for a premium tax credit and, and think about the rules that we talked about in the very first slide, then we can fill in the slick set. Remember, this is the one column that, that you are allowed to make changes to without getting a corrected form from the marketplace. So if you fill in $300 in column B, then you will get, um, then they will get that amount of uh, premium tax credit for the months of April and May in their final tally.
So an example of that, Carolina failed to reconcile her APTC for, 20, for 2017. And so she wasn't eligible for APTC in early 2019. Um, so there's kind of, a, kind of a year lag on that. She eventually filed her 2017 tax return and her APTC was reinstated starting in March 2019. So she has a form that looks like this. She paid her premium in January, she paid her premium in February, but she wasn't getting any APTC and therefore the slick sip column is blank. But that doesn't mean that she wasn't eligible for, for, um, for premium tax credit. So in this case, you would enter the slick sip for January and February. Um, and this is the only part of the 1095A you should change. Leave the APTC column blank for January and February since so she didn't get any advance credit for those months, but it is going to calculate as a PTC. So basically in that this option of, of you know, take the credit in advance versus take the credit on your tax return, for those couple of months, she'll be taking it on her tax return since she wasn't eligible to get it in advance. So we talked a lot about the 1095A, but there are some other 1095 forms that people might receive. And these are 1095Bs, which are issued by health insurance issuers. So they're issued by Medicaid, Medicare, insurers, um, others who offer coverage. Um, this is useful in determining the months the person had coverage. Um, and then there's form 1095C, which is issued by large employers and is useful in determining um, the months that someone had coverage or an offer of coverage. Now, Forms 1095B and C, don't wait for them. They don't even need to be just um, uh, sent out until March 2nd this year. They keep, you know, every year they're putting a, a delay in um, for, for these uh, issuers, so they don't need to have the forms out. So, you know, don't, taxpayers definitely don't need to wait to file. And, as you'll see in a minute, you know, these forms, especially the 1095C, um, it's, it's not foolproof because some people, even though the form says they're eligible for employer-sponsored coverage, for instance, that doesn't necessarily mean that they were ineligible for a premium tax credit. So you can't necessarily read these forms together and um, it's not going to give you all the information you need to make a decision about whether someone is eligible for a premium tax credit or not. And this brings us into the subject of overlapping coverage. This is one of the most confusing aspects, I think, of trying to determine premium tax credit eligibility. Um, in general, to be eligible for a premium tax credit, the taxpayer must not be eligible for or enrolled in other minimum essential coverage. But there are many exceptions. So the general exception is that people who are eligible for a premium tax credit on the first day of the month are considered eligible for the full month, even if they be become eligible for some other coverage later that month. So as long as you're eligible on the first day, you're good for the full month. But then there are these other program exceptions where people might have overlapping eligibility or enrollment, but still be eligible for a premium tax credit. So first let's look at Medicaid, because for a lot of our um, low-income tax clients in VITA and TCE, this is the one um, that people will encounter the most often. If a person is enrolled in APTC, but is later determined eligible for Medicaid, in general, the taxpayer is going to be eligible for a premium tax credit for the entire calendar year, even if they also enrolled in Medicaid for some of those months. Now, how would you see this? You might see this if the taxpayer has a 1095A that shows marketplace eligibility and enrollment, and they have a 1095B that shows some months of Medicaid um, enrollment. Even if that's the case, the taxpayer is generally going to be eligible for premium tax credits for the entire calendar year, even if they were also enrolled in Medicaid. And Medicaid also has something called retroactive Medicaid, which is you find out that you were eligible. Um, if you apply in July, but you had had a big car accident in June, you can actually get a couple months of retroactive Medicaid. Um, PTC is also allowed during months of re retroactive Medicaid coverage. So these overlaps are okay. You don't need to take some action to, um, to sort of disallow an APTC. Now for Medicare, there are a different set of rules. Um, for Medicare, a taxpayer who becomes, Medicare, who becomes eligible for Medicare loses their PTC eligibility on the first day of the fourth full month 
after they became eligible for Medicare, whether or not they enrolled in Medicare. So this is easiest, I think, through an example. Um, Freddie is enrolled in marketplace coverage with APTC. His 65th birthday is May 17th, and he becomes eligible to enroll in Medicare. Um, so you can see he was eligible in May. There are three full months were June, July, August. And then in September, he's not eligible for a PTC. So if he continues to get APTC all year, he'll owe back APTC for September through December because he wasn't eligible. And um, a little healthcare bonus fact, when he enrolls in Medicare uh, Part B, he'll actually pay a higher premium um, because he misses his initial open enrollment period. Now let's talk about employer-sponsored coverage. In general, a person is not eligible for premium tax credit if they, have an, if they have an affordable offer of coverage from an employer. And uh, the 1095C tells us something about whether someone has an, has an affordable offer. Um, the only people who get this are people who work for large employers, so don't expect anything similar if, you, if your um, tax client works for a small employer. But there's this big gaping safe harbor that prevents the 1095C from being as, you know, as rock solid as you think, as you think and giving you all this information about affordability. And the safe harbor says that if the taxpayer informed the marketplace of the cost of employer-sponsored coverage and the marketplace awarded APTC anyway, the taxpayer, the taxpayer can claim PTC regardless of what this form says. So basically the question you would be asking a taxpayer is, did you tell the marketplace, the marketplace that you had an offer of, of coverage from your work? You know, did you tell them that it would cost, you know, $100 a month or whatever, whatever, the, whatever the employee cost is? And if you did that and the marketplace said, still said that they were eligible, then they're eligible and we're not gonna second guess that now. And I just wanna mention um, something because it's come up for, um, for a number of you and, and I just wanna throw out the term and then we'll abandon it very quickly. This is called a QSERA and this is a qualified small employer health reimbursement arrangement. So basically, this is a tax vehicle for a small employer. Um, they can fund a tax-free employee account uh, that can be used for reimbursement of medical expenses, including a marketplace plan premium. So um, the amount that's in a QSERA is, is treated as if it were a as if it were a plan, as if it were like employ like normal employer coverage. And so the marketplace will determine, okay, so is that offer from the employer affordable or not affordable? Those are things that the marketplace will do up, you know, up front in the process. Now, the reason I'm flagging it for you is because if the, if the QSERA is unaffordable, um, so if PTC is allowed despite having this special employer offer, um, the PTC is actually going to be reduced by the amount of this account. And this is something that doesn't happen in tax layer. And so I'm raising it just because if you see something where, you know, someone says they work for a small business and you see on, on a W-2 box 12 code FF, then this is a QSERA contribution. And this is something that you're not going to be able to do in, in, um, in tax layer because the PTC um, calculation that you get, that the tax layer spits out, will need to be reduced by the amount of money that's in the QSERA. Um, and there's a whole you know, separate worksheet for this. It's in publication 974, which is where all of your um, wonkiest, most complicated PTC questions can be answered. Um, so let's recap a few of these things um, as review tips. Um, as you, you all know, that you should be printing out or you know reviewing the whole paper, the whole um, paper return. Uh, here are some of the things you're going to keep. You're going to keep in mind. So first of all, remember where you're looking. You're looking at the 8962 um, schedule two is where you'll find any excess APTC, um, and then they keep moving it around. But schedule three is where you would find a net premium tax credit. So if if someone is getting more premium tax credit, you would find it there. Um, so keep those three forms in mind. 
Now, just starting at the top of the 8962, if we're starting at the top and just working our way down through the form, what are the things that I'm looking for to make sure that this is correct? So first of all, if someone is married filing, filing separately, um, do they qualify for that exception that allows them to claim the PTC or not? Um, is, so if they qualify for the exception, the spousal abandonment or domestic abuse exceptions, that, that, um, that box at the top should be checked. Again, scanning down the form, I'm going to stop hard at 2B. This is where we're looking at the dependents modified AGI. If you have, you know, I can look at this and I can see a modified AGI of $5,000. I'm guessing that that is probably not right because um, I know that the, the, I know what the dependent filing requirements are and unless this is unearned income, which how often do we see that in Vita TCE? Um, unearned income like this for a kid, um, then this is probably wrong. I'm guessing that this is that this is earned income from a dependent that did not have a filing requirement. So I'm seeing that five thousand dollars. My you know it's it's blinking in big red for me. That's probably not right. So I'm probably going to want to go back to that question. Um, make sure that the dependent had a filing requirement. If they didn't, answer the uh, take away that that income amount. Again, scanning down the form, I'm gonna stop at, at number five. Uh, line five is the percentage of um, income as a percent of the federal poverty line. So this is, the, this is what I warned you about with someone who has income below the poverty line. This person has income at 94% of the poverty line. And um, this, uh, you can see that yes is checked, which says you're not eligible to take the PTC at this point, my head is going to explode because this person, 99.9999% is likely to be taking, to be eligible for the PTC. So I think that, that I've probably made a mistake here. Um, so I'm gonna to wanna to go back and make sure that this person doesn't fall into one of the exceptions that would allow us to check, um, to check the other box. And still on that line, if the income is 401% of the federal poverty line, then the taxpayer is going to have to repay all APTC. So let's think, let's, let's be strategic about this. Is there any way out of this hole? Um, has the taxpayer considered married filing separately? Now I know that there are some, that there are other tax consequences to that. So it may not be the right option, but if you've got, for instance, an older couple and they're not eligible for an earned income credit and they're not eligible for a bunch of these other credits, um, then it might make sense for them to file um, married filing separately if their joint, if their income filing separately is going to be less than 400% of the poverty line, just to get them into a position where they'll, they'll have a repayment cap at least. Like, yes, they'll need to repay, but they'll have a repayment cap. Um, also consider adjustments to income, like making a deductible IRA contribution or contributing to a health savings account. These are things that can bring income down. So, you know, strategize about that. I'll also say another fun fact, even though it says 401% uh, of the poverty line, um, anything over 401% is going to say 401%. I know there's something especially painful when you think that a person has just missed it, like just missed it by a hair, but they could have income. At, it could actually be 500% of the poverty line, but it would still say 401%. So, um, so take it easy on yourself. Um, okay, so again, scanning down the 8962 for problems. Um, line nine, consider whether there is an out of scope issue um, based on what the ten, based on the situation you know and based on what the um, 1095A looks like. So double check that everyone on 1095A is on the tax return. If someone is on the 1095A but they're filing a separate return, that's a shared policy allocation. Um, there are different kinds of shared policy allocations. Uh, these are out of scope, but um, I'm happy to help talk, th talk these through with you if you have individual questions. Um, the, the types that the, that the IRS delineates are taxpayers who are divorced or legally separated in 2019. So they started the year married and happy, enrolling in marketplace coverage together, and by the end of the year, it all went to hell. And they're divorced or legally separated. Um, next, taxpayers who are married but who are filing separate returns. 
third is a group um, with no AP, where no APTC gets calculated. It's not just that there's no APTC, but there's no APTC, plus you've got families on multiple tax returns. And then there's sort of a big old other calculation, which is typically involving a non-dependent non -dependent child on a parent's marketplace policy. So let's say you have a 25-year-old who can technically get insurance with mom and dad on the, in the marketplace, um, but they're actually not a dependent. They're filing their own separate return. So then you end up with a 1095A that has the whole family on it. Oh, yay. But they're on two separate tax returns. So now you've got to peel apart the 1095A, put some on tax return one, some on tax return two. Shared policy allocation rules tell us how to do that. And it, it differs depending on which situation you're in. So that's a long way of saying that's something that tax layer doesn't account for. They're just assuming that there's going to be no exception, and it's up for you. It's up to you um, to look at the 1095A and make sure that that's right. That there's no um, that 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 this is a, a return that can be in scope versus one that has a shared policy allocation that is out of scope. There's also a special exception and calculation for people who got married during 2019. I've seen this work out really well for some people and I've seen it be a wash for other people. But if, if someone is enrolled in, a premium, in um, APTC and they got married during 2019 and it looks like they owe back, then consider doing this alternative marriage calculation, which is um, in publication 974 uh, because it can, um, it can help reduce the amount people owe back. And it's a little complicated to explain why, but you gotta trust me. Continuing our way down the 8962, look out for things like this, where you have these gaps in your, in your lines. So in this case, you can see, just based on reading the columns, that there was a marketplace enrollment premium. So column A says, the person paid their premium. The person paid their premium of, you know, $1,032. That's their share plus, in the last column, the advance payment of $950. But for some reason, those other lines are blank. And that is, is going to be, that's a problem. Because if those other lines are blank, if the slick sip, column B, where I have that red box, if that's blank, that means that they're not going to get credit for paying that premium. And so this is a case where we'd want to go back, unless there's something telling us not to do this, we want to, we want to go back and make sure that we've entered the slick sip for that month. Because if we miss it, then they're not going to be eligible for the, pre, for the premium tax credit for that month. And that's going to be a big old hole in their tax return if they're not eligible for that $950 and need to repay it. Um, if there is a repayment at the end of the at the end of the form, can it be minimized? So, you know, again, make sure the repayment caps are applied um, by answering the questions correctly in Tax Slayer. If we can lower household income, let's do it. You know, contribute to a deductible IRA. Can they make an HSA contribution? Consider changing filing status. Um, you know, these sound kind of like dramatic things, but if you've got someone who owes thousands of dollars back, they are going to be ready for just about anything. If a taxpayer's um, income is over the repayment cap, so um, they're over that threshold of 400%, then is it beneficial for them to file as married filing separately instead of married filing jointly to bring their income under the 400%? Yes, technically they will be ineligible for the credit, but as long as they're under 400%, they'll have a repayment cap, which is better than being ineligible and having no repayment cap. So keep that in mind. But also, if a taxpayer's income is under the repayment cap, is it beneficial for the taxpayer to file a single instead of, let's say, head of household to get the lower cap? So remember when we showed the, re the, um, the repayment cap, there was, a, there was a column for single, and then there was a column for everyone else. So there have been some cases that I've seen where someone files as head of household, um, because they're eligible as head of household, uh, but that is also going to give them the higher repayment cap. Whereas if they were to be single with a dependent, they might have a lower repayment cap. 
Um, and of course, it, it just depends on you know what the other things on the tax return are, what the other effects of, of doing that are. But it's you know it's pretty easy to go click around in tax layer and, and figure that out and play with it. But sometimes these little tweaks can make a big difference when it comes to um, when it comes to repayment. It's always hard to talk to someone who owes money, and it doesn't matter what the source of that um, of, of that deficit is. It's still a hard conversation to have. With regard to the health insurance stuff, try to determine why the advance payment was too high. So, you know, do you think there's an error? Like, do you, does this, is this just not making sense and there, there might be an error on 1095A? It happens. It's worth looking into. Or did the person make an error in estimating their income at the, at the start of the year? Was there an error in calculating family size? Maybe they didn't know who would be a dependent and who wouldn't be. Has their family status changed? So. Um, maybe, you know, they thought they would be married finally jointly, but they're really married finally separately. Has a dependent joined or left the family? Um, you can also encourage taxpayers to take less than the maximum APTC in future years. You can remind them to promptly report changes in income and family size. Um, and if someone has a uh, repayment on the tax return that you're preparing, on their 2019 tax return, and they're still enrolled for 2020, encourage them to update their information so they don't have the same hole um, in their 2020 tax return when they come to see you the next year. One final thing to, um, to note, this, you've probably seen these letters before. I feel like I've seen a million of them. This is the 12C letter. Um, this letter indicates a delay in return processing. So someone will get this letter when they submit a return, but they didn't, um, they didn't reconcile their, um, their premium tax credit. So the IRS has a record of them having a premium tax credit, but then when they submit their return, they didn't include it. So in general, what they're looking for is um, you to submit form 1095, a copy of Form 1095A, Form 8962, and then page two of the 1040. Um, this is in lieu of doing a full amended return. So that's all clearly laid out in the instructions there. And if someone didn't respond, you know, their return may have been sent to exams for review and assessment. At that point, you can consider amending the tax return just to, um, just to sort of help resolve that situation. But in general, what they're looking for is not an amended return, but just the specific information. And with that, Ina, do we have questions? We do have a couple questions, Tara. Um, so first question is, um, should tax preparers check every slick SIP to make sure they're correct um, for every 8962 they come across? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, okay, so uh, I, would say, I would say no, you don't have to check every slick SIP. Um, especially if the results of, of your um, of your 8962 makes sense. So if everything is kind of lining up and everything is in the ballpark, then I probably wouldn't check it. But I personally, anytime someone has a, a, has a repayment, I'm probably going to just try to unearth anything. <laughs> and so I would probably, I would probably double check it, but I would definitely double check it if things just are not making sense in this form. You know, if, if you think that there's, if there's something just wrong here, um, then a good place to start is just to go back to healthcare.gov, check the slick SIP. It takes just a minute. If you are in a state-based marketplace, it might take more than a minute. Um, so it's, it really depends on your specific marketplace, how easy they make it. With healthcare.gov, it is really pretty easy. They don't have it up yet um, for, this, for this season, but it's, it's, I, th I think it's going to be the same as last year, which is, you know, really just entering in some very basic information about about who's who's in the policy and where they live. Great. Um, and is Kisera out of scope for Vita? So my understanding is that it's out of scope. I haven't actually. I don't think I've seen that written down anywhere. Um, so I don't work for the IRS, and I don't. I don't specifically work for Vita either, right? So I, I'm going to tell you, I recognize how hard it is when you've got a low-income person who, you know, for some reason is, is out of scope when you feel like, 
I can read the instructions probably better than they can and get them to an accurate, more accurate result than they could on their own. So I'm not telling you that you should do out-of-scope returns. That would be wrong. Um, but I'm saying that I know I understand the tendency to want to do those in some cases, and I understand that some programs are more flexible than others in doing those. Um, so that's my long-winded way of saying even though you can't do this in tax slayer because you have to do the subtraction from the um, from the premium tax credit that tax slayer just doesn't let you do um, I think it's totally doable on a paper return um, so if you have a you know a low-income tax taxpayer these situations are are really pretty clear the instructions are pretty clear um, if you want to in your personal capacity help them out let me know and I'm happy to, I'm happy to lend a hand. Um, in an example where somebody forgets to pay a premium for a month, during their tax filing process, they go back and they pay that premium. Should they wait for the new 1095A before filing their taxes? Um, that's a really good question. I love these questions. Um, I would say, I would, I would probably say not to wait. Um, I would probably say to file the tax return and then, um, you know, you may get a 12C letter because things aren't lining up for the IRS, but then hopefully by then you would be able to answer it with a corrected 1095A. Um, the problem with 1095A is that even after you get them corrected from the marketplace, they are, or in the past have been sent out in batches. And so if I go and I, I give them all the, uh, you know, we, we work out the correct 1095A, and we do it on February 1st. It might be that that sits there at the marketplace until, let's say, February 20th, um, when they send out a batch of corrections um, all at once. And so it can take a long time to get a marketplace cor um, corrected 1095A. And that's why I'm hesitant to say, oh, yeah, you know, you've got to wait. Because in many cases, you know, it is quite a wait and it will be past the, past the filing season. So, you know, it's a little bit of a, on something like this where the numbers have changed, you know, you may not have success, but I would say to, to file it anyway and then try to deal with the IRS after that because, um, if, if we just assume that we're going to wait, you may never see that client again because it may be a very long wait. Great. And um, one more question. Under what circumstances do you override the tax family size? Oh, I knew someone was going to ask that. Um, I don't know. I was try I was, I've been playing around with this to figure out when do you want to change the tax, the the. Um, use that option to change the tax family size. I think if you if you were doing a shared policy allocation, you would definitely want to change the. Well, you might want to do it if you're if you're doing a shared policy allocation in some cases, um, but you wouldn't be doing it through tax layer. So I, I was struggling on, on trying to figure out when you would want to change the tax family size. Um, so I would say don't click on that button. I clicked on it a couple times and I played around with it, but. Um, but it's not the case that you only put in your tax family the people who are enrolled in premium tax credits. That's definitely not the case. Your tax family is supposed to align with who is in your, in your tax household. So um, even if only one person in a four-person family gets a premium tax credit, on your 8962, when it, when it asks for family size, it should be four. It shouldn't just be that one person who got the tax credit. So don't go, so don't go crazy starting to override family size. Um, it's, it's also going to get you the, a, a, not just an inaccurate result, but probably a, a result that's unfavorable to the, to the taxpayer if you start reducing family size from where it should be, because it'll change your federal poverty line calculations. Is it acceptable to file a prior year's 1095A? So filing, what does that mean? Um, I, I believe they're asking whether it's acceptable to use a um, prior year's 1095A. Um, so, so you need the 1095A for 2019 um, because all the information certainly changes. Premiums change every year. Um, the APTC changes. Um, but certainly if you're if you're doing a prior year return, uh, you would need that, the corresponding year is 1095A. Great. 
everything. And one last question. Mm -hmm. um, what does a tax preparer do generally if they meet an out of scope situation? If you meet an out of scope situation, and I step in this all the time because I love the challenge of it, right? But this is where I don't work for the IRS and so I can say things like that. Um, you know, it really depends on your program. So the IRS would say, stop, don't do it. Your program will probably say, stop, don't do it. Um, the liability insurance your program has would definitely say, stop, don't do it. Um, I, I like to try to give some additional guidance to taxpayers because if they don't, if they're not going to get help from me, where are they going to get it? So, um, so it's, you know, talk to your program about what, about what you feel comfortable with. And, um, Again, not that I'm encouraging you to help people who are out of scope, but a lot of problems come up, even in scope situations come up. So definitely don't be shy. You can, my contact information is here. You know, you can reach out through the tax season. I love hearing all of your weird stories um, and love helping you work through this on tax layer. So just as I, you know, work through things with my, with my own program. So, um, so don't be a stranger. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions, um, whether they were covered here or not. Great. Thank you so much, Tara. And as a reminder, we'll be distributing the materials from today's session via email. We'll also post everything to the Beyond the Basics website at www.healthreformbeyondthebasics.org. And it'll be posted under the For Tax Preparers tab. If you have questions or need assistance, please email us at beyondthebasics at cb pp.org or you can email Tara directly at the email address on the screen. And with that, we'll bring today's webinar to a close. Thank you again for joining us today.